All right, well, so we'll be reading uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 27 this morning. And I titled this morning's message, You're Not an Orphan. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and, and go to John 14, and, and uh, we will start reading. John 14, starting in verse 1, says, Let not your heart be troubled. <clears throat> you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. You know, I'm going to just stop for a second and, and just point out something that I really, I, I had never really noticed this before. Later on in this passage of scripture, the Lord talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit previous, really what he's talking about, he doesn't spell it out exactly like this, but what he's talking about is previous to what he's about to do, he's about to go to the cross and he's about to die for the sins of humanity. And previous to that, the Holy Spirit dwelled with the people of God. But after he goes to the cross and accomplishes the will of the Father, then now the Holy Spirit is going to be able to indwell the people of God. Yeah. And the same word that's used right there, speaking of the Holy Spirit indwelling believers, is the same word that speaks of here where Jesus says, many mansions. In my Father's house are many mansions. So we should not get the idea... Really, number one, that we're, you know, that we're going to be living in some grandiose mansion or whatever the case. But really the idea is, is that Jesus is now preparing a place for us to dwell, a place for us to abide, a place where we will live. Now, what was interesting to me, and I really didn't uh, develop the thought much, but uh, that the Holy Spirit... Uh, is looking for a place to dwell upon this earth today. Amen. And the way that the Holy Spirit dwells upon this earth is inside the hearts and lives of believers. It's God's will that his presence be on the earth. It's God's earth. Amen. He created it. He spoke it into existence. Then he gave Adam the, the opportunity to have dominion over the earth. So God really created this earth. And we've talked about that when we went through the book of Genesis for a, a place for mankind to dwell, a place where man could live and God could live in relationship with him. And because of the fall, it's caused a separation to take place. Things are not the way that God intended for them to be. But because Adam and also us through free will have relinquished much control over to the enemy. But God has a plan by which through man's free will, his presence can dwell upon this earth, amen, inside the hearts and lives of believers. Now, so what, the main point that I wanted to make with all this is this, is that today God's presence abides and dwells in the hearts of believers. But also today, Jesus is preparing a place for That's believers, right. Right. a place where they can dwell and abide in the presence of God for all eternity. Amen. Uh, it says in verse uh, three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know, Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not where you go and how can we know the way Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes unto the father, but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the father and it suffices us. Jesus says unto him, have I been so long time with you? And yet have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the father. And how sayest thou then show us the father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me and the works that I do shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you, ask, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. 
I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world sees me no more. But you see me, because I live. You shall live also. At that day, you shall know that I am in, the, in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas, Judas says unto him, not Iscariot, in other words, it wasn't Judas Iscariot, but the other one. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loves me not, keeps not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives it, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so in this passage of scripture, I titled it once again, You're Not an Orphan. There's three main verses that really stuck out to me that kind of really encompass the whole idea of what Jesus is communicating right here. Number one, in verse one, John 14, verse one, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe You believe in God. Believe also in me. You know, it's a, we have to try to put our minds in, you know, connect our minds to the minds of the disciples in order to really be able to understand the words of our Lord, right? The disciples previously, as the Jewish nation and as descendants of the Jewish nation, would have known the God who created the worlds. I mean, they had the word of God. They had the Old Testament. They were the people of God that represented God on the earth. Now Jesus is the manifestation of Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one that had been promised in the Old Testament. Amen. And now they've been walking with him. But even still, their minds, the connections, you know how when you first got saved and you were reading the word of God and you began to understand more about the things of God. But at the same time, it's sometimes it's still kind of foggy. It's still kind of fuzzy as far as for really understanding exactly what's going on. We, well, I understand that we won't really know exactly what's going on until we see the Lord, but you know what I'm talking about. It's Paul said we we, we see through a, a glass dimly, like it's not always completely clear. Well, for the disciples, we have to understand that they didn't understand everything, even though they walked so closely with him each and every day. But Jesus is saying, let your heart not be troubled. You've believed in God. You need to believe also in me. Amen. Um, the word troubled there literally describes inward commotion. It describes an inward commotion, inward turmoil. It describes a spiritual condition where there's a lack of peace. Uh, and there's an uneasiness connected to it. And there's an instability that causes restlessness. Many times you yourself have experienced a, a troubled heart. And you know people that have experienced troubled hearts. The uneasiness and the commotion that goes on with the trials of life and the things that are taking place. The pain that's caused because of the fact that the world world has fallen. And all of this commotion and unrest that goes on on the inside of our hearts, many times it can lead us to make rash decisions. It can lead us to make decisions that will affect our lives from that point moving forward, Amen. right? Amen. Instead of learning how to hope in and, and to trust completely in the Lord and, and to keep our eyes on Him, we will make decisions. Sometimes it's decisions about relationships, you know, sometimes uh, we people may feel lonely, right? I mean, hey, look, people, it's a real thing that people experience. They may feel lonely. And so what they do is, is that they'll make a rash decision to enter into a relationship in order to fill that void. But, but it was the wrong relationship and it was the wrong decision to make. And it ultimately leads to untold <coughs> sorrow and pain. And that's just one example. There's other examples we could go on and on, whether it be people engaging in alcohol to try to numb the pain 
that they feel or just other things, other decisions, buying stuff. You know, people, sometimes we buy things to try to make ourselves feel better. Somehow it does something to the, something in our brain. Neurotransmitters are manipulated when we buy something for ourselves. And, and just these various things that people are troubled and they're feeling commotion and restlessness. That's what Jesus is saying. Let your heart not be troubled. Don't be uneasy. Don't be let, allow yourself to be full of commotion. And then whenever you find yourself in this circumstance, we need to realize that there's right ways to handle this and there's wrong ways to handle it. And Jesus wants us to understand how to handle it. So that's what he said in verse 1. Once again, the title of the message this morning is that you're not an orphan. And that Jesus is about to go away. That's what's happening. He's about to go away to the cross. He's about to go back to the Father. His disciples feel uneasy. They feel unrest. They feel commotion in their life. Right? Uh, and so he goes on to say this, though, in verse 18. If you'll throw verse 18 up on the screen. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And this is why, how I got the title to the message this morning. <clears throat> that you, you're not an orphan. Because that word uh, comfortless right there, I never really had seen this before. I've studied this and preached from some of this before, is the Greek word orphanos, which is where we get the word orphan. And so the word literally means to be without parent. And so what Jesus is saying is, I'm not going to leave you parentless. I'm not going to leave you without protection. I'm not going to leave you without protection in your life. Yes, I have to go away, but you need to know you're not an orphan, amen, and I'm not leaving you alone in this endeavor in order to travel this earth as my disciples or my people that, I've, that we've called you to be, amen? And then he goes on to say in verse 27 of John 14, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So like I said, these, first, these three verses capture the whole idea of what Jesus is speaking of as he speaks to his disciples. They're troubled in their hearts. They're full of commotion and uneasiness because they're aware of the fact that Jesus is about to go back to the Father. And, and all of this it, fear is based upon this. He knows that the disciples will be worried that they will be alone without the Lord to get them through. And Jesus wants them to know that it's going to be okay. He promises them that he won't leave them comfortless without a parent and, and that he won't be, they won't be left alone as orphans. Instead, God promises that his disciples would have peace on this earth. Amen. It may not seem like that big of a deal. When you really think about it, it's like, okay, well, so Jesus has been with you and he's about to go to heaven. You've seen him raise the dead. You've seen him perform miracles. Why are you so stressed out? It's going to be okay. But, but really, if you think about it for the disciples, once again, they don't have, I don't mean to digress so much, but you know, for the longest time, I had a real difficult time understanding the lives of the disciples. You know what I'm saying? I mean, come on, somebody help me out here. You know, I mean, you know, they walked with Jesus, right? I, Paul, Paul got beaten five times with whips, three times with rods hit in his head, stoned and left for dead, shipwrecked and left in the deep two different times, thrown in prison, left naked, hungry, thirsty, in the cold, all for the purpose of preaching the gospel. I have not arrived. <laughs> but can I tell you this also? The, the, you know, you see these pictures. And most of them come from the from the Catholic religion. I'm not over here just necessarily pick on people. I'm just here to tell you the truth. Where they have the halo behind their head. That, that's actually a cultic. We won't get into all that. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a picture of the sun disc. And it, and it actually comes from occultism. But, but, but we, well, let's, not, let's not go too far into that right now. Okay? But what I will say is this. That this halo that they would put behind their head gave us this appearance like, woo. You know, like, look, uh, look they're, they're such a cut above us. They're so far away from us. And what you and I need to understand is, is that they were real human beings just like you and I are. Amen? And yes, they, they sold out and they gave their heart and their lives to the Lord. But for us to be disciples of the Lord, we're supposed to give our heart to Him also. And what they've done is they were the first ones. I mean, that's pretty powerful if you think about it. What I'm trying to say is this. Have you ever tried to witness to anybody about Jesus? I mean, you know, I'm not asking for a raise of hands. But have you ever even tried to open your mouth for the Lord before in public? I mean, it's gotten a lot easier for me through the years, I'll be honest with you. 
But I can remember when I first gave my heart to Jesus. And there would be something on the inside of me that was saying, you're supposed to be telling somebody something about me. At least that's what the preacher told me. And, and I'm going to keep on telling people too, we're supposed to be light in the midst of darkness. I didn't write that. The Holy Spirit wrote it. And, and Matthew uh, chronicled it in his gospel that we're supposed to be light on the earth, salt to the earth. In some way, shape, or form, not necessarily standing on a box on the street corner with a megaphone or carrying a cross through the streets, but in some way, shape, or form in the people's lives that we, that we have connection to, they're supposed to be seeing Amen. Jesus in us. Now, you've got to put yourself in the disciples' shoes for a minute. Here they are, minding their own business. Yeah, they know God. They know the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus, the Messiah, the one that was promised, shows up on the scene. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And through reference of the scriptures, we can pretty much assume that this was Andrew. The Bible tells us it was Andrew and John, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, separated. They were disciples of John the Baptist, separated themselves from him, connected themselves to Jesus, and then it began. One after the other, they, Andrew finds his brother Peter. They find Philip in the, in the fishing town of Galilee where Jesus was from. Then they find Nathaniel under the fig tree. And they found Matthew, the tax collector. And it, it goes on. And what they're doing is, is that each time they're separating themselves from their previous life, from what they knew before, and they're connecting themselves to Jesus. And everything about Jesus is completely different than the world around them. Okay. Everything about Jesus, he's, he's full of selflessness. He's full of humility. Even, I mean, we talk about this all the time, but even in the way that he's born, the Lord's trying to communicate something to us, his people, to let us be aware that the world out there and the things that it's trying to tantalize us with are a bunch of lies. Listen, we all fall into the, into the lies. We all fall into the deception. But what we need to understand is, is that the world is being driven by another spirit. Jesus was born in a manger and it didn't smell good. He was a king that wasn't born in a castle. He was born in a manger amongst animals and in, in his gifts that were given by the wise men was one of the gifts was myrrh. Yes, gold that showed he was a king, purple that showed he would be a priest, but myrrh to embalm dead bodies. Even in his birth, the crucifixion was foretold. Then when he rides into town as a king a week before the crucifixion, he shows up on a donkey. What I'm trying to make a point to you is this, is that the disciples and everything that they knew about life before, now they've separated themselves from the world and they've connected themselves to Jesus. And for the last three and a half years, they've learned of his teachings. They learned of his ways. And even whenever he was on the mountaintop and he was preaching to the multitudes, he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. It sounds a whole lot different than our current president. I'm not trying to pick on him. I don't know what all that, every time I turn on the news, I don't turn it on much anymore. Got some kind of new mess going on. I don't know if he did it, any of the stuff, if he's just being, I don't know. But I do know this, the way that he, his perception of the world and the perception of the master, two different perceptions. I'm not against capitalism. I'm not against being able to make money. I'm not against working hard and getting paid. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I'm really trying to say is this, is that in a, a world that is driven by finance and getting the upper hand, Jesus is preaching a whole different world. He's, he's right. preaching something that's completely different, a completely different kingdom. Amen. A, a kingdom of humility, a kingdom of selflessness. And now the disciples have connected to Jesus and what he believes. And now all of a sudden he's going away. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't you be afraid. It's going to be okay. And so they were alone. And the point that how I got off on this digression was, have you ever tried to even tell anybody about the Lord before? Have you ever tried to mention Jesus? you ever felt how the first couple times you did that, how funny you felt? Yeah. How, how difficult it might have been? <laughs> Your heart might have even been beating a little fast. Now you can imagine the whole world, the Roman Empire, and this little fledgling. I mean, have you ever even thought of that before? The Roman, mighty Roman Empire. And this little fledgling group of 12 men. Yeah, Judas died and then Paul ends up taking his place. This little group of men and how God used this to completely transform the world. God's kingdom is existing on this earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's difficult for us to see because we're being sold a bill of goods that says that it's supposed to look this way. 
chandeliers and golden chairs and big cars and nice suits and this, that, and the other thing. What I'm here to tell you is, is this. That's not the kingdom of God. Amen. And if we're not careful, we're going to get be confused and, and buy into something that's not even really God or the church to begin with. It may not seem like that big of a deal, but once again, by the end of Jesus' ministry, the crowd started to dwindle. You remember in John chapter 6, whenever Jesus said, my flesh is true meat, my blood is true drink? What he was talking about, he was talking about communion. He was talking about he was going to, he was talking about spiritual nourishment. They, once again, the Catholic religion has turned it into something that it's not. They talk about this transubstantiation thing where some kind of miracle takes place. Whenever, that's not that where it becomes his literal flesh and blood. That's not what he's talking about. He, just as you have to eat physical food in order to nourish your physical body, Jesus is the spiritual nourishment that you need upon this earth. Amen. And you must feed on him. Yeah, part of that is reading your Bible. Part of that is spending time in prayer. But it's built upon faith. That's right. Faith in Him and faith in what He did and how He died on the cross for your sin. And how you were born a sinner like Adam. And that you need a Savior like Jesus. Amen. And when you put faith in that, an exchange takes place. Amen. He took your wickedness, your guilt, my wickedness, my guilt, laid it upon Himself. And then He gave us an exchange where He gave us His righteousness. Yes. And because of that exchange that took place, we can now have a relationship with God. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, He's teaching us His ways. His teaching spoke of humility and selflessness, which was so opposite of everything around them. And therefore, they were in fear of the unknown. It's hard to imagine. I was just thinking about an orphan, you know, because of that word orphanos. It was standing out to me. And it's hard to imagine the life of an orphan if you've never been one. I've never been an orphan. I, you know, I had a couple of friends that were adopted. And to be honest with you, a couple of times in my childhood, I just kind of stopped and thought about that. Like, what? It, how does that feel? You know, and I don't know why I would think that way, but I would. How does that feel for a person to be adopted? Thank God for parents that are willing to adopt, adopt mm -hmm. children, you know. But I started thinking about orphans. And not every story of an orphan is always a horror story. Right. But at the same time, there's a lot of bad ones. As a matter of fact, I kind of actually Googled that. Famous orphans. And dude, you ought to see the list. And most of them, it, it was a mess, right? Because you don't really even realize the pain and the, the things that they experience. But I can remember as I was thinking about it that I watched this documentary a long time of these orphans that live in Bogota, Colombia. I mean, they're from six years old until, you know, teenagers. They live on the street. They, they run the streets like a, like a wild pack of animals. And, and they, they, they live at night. And what they do is there's a big thing where they, where they huff this glue. They get high on glue. It's how they numb their pain. I mean, it's like their life, their life is miserable. And so they're running around. They, they, they live like a pack of wild animals. And they huff on this glue. And they get high. And they, they end up sooner or later, they pass out. But they're addicted to this stuff. And, and it's just, it's just a, it was a real sad, miserable existence. I remember that. But then I was thinking, you know, surely there's a good story somewhere. So I found this one story of this girl named Hannah. And uh, Hannah was uh, born in Uganda. And, and she lost both of her parents. And she was walking down the street, hungry. Her clothes were tattered and torn. And she was found by a Christian organization and she was given a place to live. You know, in the passage of scripture that we're talking about, Jesus says, let your heart not be troubled. In my father's house, there's many mansions. We already talked about the fact that that means there's a place for you to dwell. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Jesus is going ahead of us and he's preparing a place for the true believers of God where they will reside for eternity. And this young girl was found on the streets by this Christian organization. She was given a place to live. She was given food to eat. She was given clothes to wear. She just turned 18 here recently. And one of the things that she started to do was she'll go to the nursing home and she'll minister to people. And one, recently in one of these uh, services, she gave her testimony and then she preached out of John 3.16. And the Holy Spirit just compelled her to ask people, have you ever received Jesus? Have you ever accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And most of the people in the crowd were not believers. And 30 people that day raised their hand and gave their heart to the Lord. I, I was just thinking about the fact of such a hopeless situation. So hopeless. So helpless. And yet, look what the Holy Spirit can do in the life of a person. No matter who you are, where you've been, what you've been experiencing. Yep. No matter how bad it is for people that you might, might know. 
You need to understand and we need to believe that there's hope in Christ. That if God can turn around a person's life like that, and at the same time, if he can do the work that he did in the disciples' lives, and, and, and at the same time, he can do the work that he's done in our lives, we need to remember that, amen, and we need to remember that we're not orphans, amen? We're not orphans. Even in our lives, there are times that we can be plagued with loneliness and fear about the uncertainties of life, and sometimes the life of Christianity can be a lonely one, amen? Whether it be in school or on the job, when we're surrounded by people that are in the world and aren't like we are. <clears throat> Am I, does that make sense what I'm trying to tell you? Have you ever tried to really live for the Lord? And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> I'm being real clear today, that the world and the church are not the same. They're two separate entities. The world is living its life one way. And the kingdom of God, people in the kingdom of God are living their lives another way. The two of them are not the same. And sometimes when you make the decision to live your life separate from the ways of the world, it can be lonely. Mm -hmm. It can be sometimes, like the disciples are probably feeling right now, you can feel alone. But the Lord's saying, don't let your heart be troubled. Amen. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send a comforter. And that's the first thing that I need you to know. When you're going through things in life, when you're going through the uncertainties of life, sometimes you might even feel lonely. Number one, you need to know that you're not an orphan. You have a home. Amen. Go back to John 14, verses 1 through 4. We have a home. You need to be reminded of that this morning. And I need to be reminded of that this morning. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way you know. You know, Jesus was a carpenter when he was on earth. Most of us know that. Now he's a master carpenter. Amen. Because, I mean, he's building the church on earth. But he's in heaven preparing a place for you and I to dwell in eternity. The way that he builds the church is, is that he allows the lives of believers to be vessels through which, in which the Holy Spirit lives and through which the Holy Spirit moves and operates. Amen. And as we are light on the earth and salt on the earth. The Holy Spirit will use us to let other people know the truth of the gospel, the truth of the kingdom, and give them the opportunity to believe this gospel message by faith and to give their hearts to the Lord if they so choose. One interesting thing is that Jesus is saying that I'm in my father's house or many mansions. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I've done some. I'm not Jewish, <laughs> uh, but I have done some research on Jewish culture. And during the time frame when Jesus was alive, and it may still be this way today, I'm not real sure. Um, but the Jewish wedding, there was a part to it called the ketubah, which was the marriage contract. So the bridegroom would come to the bride and he would offer a contract. There was a, a dowry or a price that was paid. Jesus has already come to the bride the first time and he's offered a contract. The contract that he offered was a ransom through the shedding of his blood and the giving of his life to marry himself to a bride. Well, what ends up taking place now is that once that part of the portion is taking place, the, the bridegroom goes back to his father's house and he prepares a place adjacent to his father's house for him and his bride to dwell. Jesus now has gone away back to his father's house. He's preparing a place for a bride. He's coming back. Then afterwards, he would come back and he would get the bride and he would take her back. <laughs> To his father's house. That's the, that's the parable of the ten the virgins. The five foolish ones. The five wise ones. At some point in time. The bridegroom came. Five were ready. Five weren't. Then whenever they realize that they had missed. They're knocking on the door. It's too late at that point in time. What you and I need to understand. Is that Jesus is a master carpenter. What you and I need to understand. You're not an orphan. We have a home. And that Jesus is preparing a place. For you and I. One of the main things that I wanted you to realize. Is that yes. The Lord is coming back again, but in this passage of scripture, we can equate a few spiritual truths that are important for us to understand. Number one, Jesus' salvation work on earth is complete. 
He said it. Amen. He said it is finished. Amen. Whenever Jesus died on the cross, the, the, the complete payment for the sins of mankind was taken care of. Amen. That The resurrection proves that. The resurrection proves that Jesus had no sin and that every sin was paid for. Amen. How do I know that? Because the wages of sin is death. If Jesus had had sin, he wouldn't have rose from the dead. And if all sin wasn't paid for, he wouldn't have rose from the dead. Well, how do you know he rose from the dead, preacher? Because he lives in my heart. Amen. Right. Amen. And if, he, if you're born again and the Holy Ghost is moving into your heart, then you know what I'm talking about. That, that the Father's presence now lives in you. Amen. Amen. You, can't, you can't trick somebody on that deal. When you get saved, you can, listen, there are people that will turn their back on the Lord. There, there are people, we went to a place to eat the other day, and I'm telling you, it's like, I showed up at this place to eat, and it's like, it was just, it was kind of like a mixture between, you know, a hybrid place where you can eat food and then there's other stuff going on, is the point. And it, I could feel darkness in the air. And I was just trying to think to myself, it's hard to believe I feel so out of place in this place. I feel so uncomfortable here. How, how is it that people that know the Lord and live for God find themselves back in places like this? It's so different than the kingdom of God. The, the feeling of darkness, the absence of light, the, the people focused on doing whatever it is that they're doing and so far away, you know, looking towards something else to fill the emptiness and the void in their life. I'm not being judgmental. I'm just saying. But yet at the same time, people, they do. They find themselves in the pain of life. They don't know who their father is. They don't realize that there's a home that's waiting for them. And they find themselves back into that. I would, I would imagine that a person that really knows the Lord to find themselves falling back into that would, would, would have to really fight the conviction for quite some time that have to really fight the conviction and, and really throw it off and just try to put it in the back of their mind in order to come to a place where they can even dwell in that type of atmosphere again. You know, how much they must have to reject the presence of God in order to find themselves back in that particular situation or circumstance. There's many times in life that we're going to find ourselves feeling like the, like the disciples. I believe that. Troubled. Finding ourselves in the midst of commotion, uneasiness, unrest. But a couple of things that we need to remember is this. The first thing is that we have a home. Amen. Even Jesus, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Part of this verse right here speaks of the fact that Jesus was looking to the future. When Jesus was finding himself in the most difficult of circumstances, in the most, uh, the most, the worst time of his life, we get a glimpse into what was going on inside of his heart and spirit based on the Holy Spirit's testimony of Hebrews 12 too. It says to us who are believers, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He didn't quit. Amen. And when the time was the worst, when the time was toughest, when the times were hard, when there could have been unrest and trouble and troublesome. Well, I mean, look, there, there had to be some commotion going on because, I mean, Jesus is over there sweating drops of blood in Gethsemane. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? I'm not, I, I can't really get into the heart of Jesus or the mind of Jesus and tell you exactly what he was feeling because I'm a sinful man and Jesus wasn't. I, I'm not connected to the Father as closely as what Jesus was. But I can tell you that something, some turmoil is going on on the inside of his humanity. You don't just start breaking capillaries in your sweat glands and blood start. If there's not some stress to your physical person, something going on there, some turmoil that's taking place in his life. He's about to be, he, he's about to be betrayed by his own followers. He was the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. How, how are you making a connection here, preacher? Well, what I'm trying to say is this, is that when Jesus was in the worst time of his life, he looked forward to the joy that was set Amen. before him. Amen. It wasn't the end. He knew that what he was about to accomplish was going to accomplish something. It was going to change things for him again. Put him back in the place where he was before, in the glory with the Father. But it was also going to change things for you and I. Yes. It was going to give hope for you and I. 
that was going to give them access to eternity for you and I. The ability for you and I to have relationship with God the Father today through Him, but also looking forward to a day when the pain will stop, when the tears will be dry, Amen. Amen. when there's an eternal home that's awaiting the people of God. The question that we have to ask ourselves, if you don't remember anything else, because truth be told, I've been told more than once, you used so many words, you lost me 10 minutes ago. If I lost you 10 minutes ago because I lost, you used too many words, don't forget this. This place is not your home. And that's right. I mean, time and again, we see in the scripture where we're called pilgrims. Yeah. If you've made this place your home, if you got all your landscaping done and planted you a few trees and hung a whole bunch of pictures on the wall, I'm using that metaphorically. Yeah. That means you stay in a while. Then it's going to be a sad day. Listen to me. I understand that we have to live here. I understand that each and every day we're tempted with the physical realm that we engage. I understand that the world around us is telling us that this is what life is. But I'm here to tell you, we need to learn what the Lord says. If we're connected to him, we need to learn how to serve him and live for him. Amen. Amen. And we have to be careful that as we're pilgrims on the journey, that we don't get so closely connected to this earth that we allow what it offers to choke the life of God out of us. Amen. Jesus warned it. Warned us of it in the parable of the sower. One of the seeds fell on the soil that also grew thorns. And the thorns wrapped around the seed of the gospel and choked it out. Choked the life of it out. And, and the thorns were the cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. There's things on this earth. There's things that this earth promises that will cause confusion. And before you realize it, we'll begin to deceive you. Listen, you have a home. It's waiting for you. Jesus is preparing a place for you. There's an eternity, amen, that, that, is, that is waiting for us. And you and I have to stay faithful on the journey as we go through. Sometimes it's going to be hard. Sometimes there's going to be troubles. Jesus told the disciples, let your heart not be troubled in my father's house or many mansions. And I go away to prepare a place for you. If it weren't so, I wouldn't tell you. Jesus looked towards the hope of the accomplished future when he endured the shame of Calvary, the joy that was set before him. And like I was saying, sometimes the path of life is hard, right? Hope for, but, but I'm here to tell you that in the gospel, there's hope for tomorrow and there's strength for today. The apostle Paul really was no different. Now, we've already talked about how harsh the world was towards him and towards the true followers of God. But he was determined that the home that awaited him in the future was far greater than the pain he experienced today. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he said that right there. The Apostle Paul said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. That's right. Amen. That's right. There's a hope for tomorrow. There's a home for tomorrow. There's a resting place Amen. for the child of God. Sometimes... You're going to experience persecution. Sometimes you're going to experience pain as you separate yourself from the world and connect yourself to the things of God. But good news, it's a temporary state of mind. Amen. Amen. And it's not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. So that was point number one. You have a home. You're not an orphan. You have a home. Point number two, we have a father. But you can't know him without knowing Jesus. You cannot know the father without knowing Jesus. There's one thing about a father to a child, and that is a feeling of protection and safety. I really, listen, I can't get inside each and every one of your heads. I don't know what your relationship with your father was like. Some people are like, protection and safety, dude? Really? <laughs> That's not what I felt with my daddy. But, I, and, I, and I understand what you're saying. I had a pretty rough dad. Uh, there was some times in my young life where, uh, you know, there was a lot of stress connected to my relationship with my dad. But I got to tell you, I can remember sitting in the car with him, driving down the road and feeling like there was nothing bad that could happen to me because I was with dad. You understand what I'm saying? And there's a big part to a father's role in the life of his children that provides protection and safety. And part of what Jesus is talking about, he's talking about don't let your heart be troubled. And he's talking about a, a relationship with the father. And he's saying that I'm not going to leave you orphanless. That word comfortless means orphanos, which means without a parent, without protection, without safety. And so I just wanted to remind you that, that we, amen, have a father. And But the only way we're ever going to know the father 
is if we actually get to know Jesus. So in John chapter 14, verses 5 through 11, Thomas says unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, or from this day forward, you know him and have seen him. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it will suffice us. In other words, just show us to him and, and we'll stop all this silliness. We'll be happy. We'll be satisfied. Just show us the Father and we'll stop all of this. Jesus says unto him, have I been such a long time with you and yet you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest then, show us the Father? Believe thou not that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. You know, the same Thomas that couldn't believe that the Lord had actually resurrected is the one that started this dialogue here. And to be truthful, in the past, there was times when I thought that this was just another example of Thomas's doubt and unbelief. You know, uh, how are we supposed to know? We don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. But, you know, and maybe there was some of that connected there. I wasn't in the room. I can't really put exactly, you know, put all the pieces of the puzzle together. But I will tell you that partly what Thomas is dealing with, he just doesn't know. He, he doesn't understand exactly how Jesus is the way, the hadas, the pathway in order to get to the presence of the Father. He doesn't understand exactly what Brother Larson calls the divine entanglement. Jesus is in the Father. The Father's in Jesus. We're in Jesus. The Lord's in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're all wrapped up in communion with one. They don't understand all of that completely. What he doesn't understand is that Jesus is the access point to get him where he needs to go. The place where he will spend eternity with the Father. But even more importantly, he doesn't understand that Jesus reveals the Father to the disciples. If truth be told, that it's usually the cause of all of our fears. We just fear the unknown. We just don't know what to expect. And because we don't know what to expect, we become troubled and restless and often make decisions that affect our lives negatively. But Jesus is saying that we don't have to do that because we know the way. We know the Father because we know Him. Amen? Amen. All good fathers instruct and teach their children in the right way or path and try to alleviate the fears and anxieties that will prevent their children from reaching the intended destination. That's what a good father does. He teaches his children the right way, the right path. Right? Right? Certainly, God the Father does the same. He reveals His will and His ways to His children through communication, just as a physical father does today. That word communication is the one I need you to hold on to right there. I know I'm using a lot of words. <coughs> communication. God the Father, you have a father. And the only way He's going to be revealed to you is through the Son. <coughs> just as a physical father communicates through words to instruct His children... God the Father communicated His will to us also. A couple of passages of Scripture I want to share with you to make my point. Colossians 1.15, talking about Jesus. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. We're not going to talk about what firstborn means. The Greek word is prototokos. It talks about a prototype. Whenever somebody invents something, they usually got to have the first one, and from that one, all the rest are made. Jesus was not born. Jesus was not created. He was in the beginning with the Father, but through him creation came forth, right? The point I want to focus on is this. He is the image of the invisible God. When you see Jesus in the pages of Scripture, when you see the way he handled situations, when you hear the words that he spoke, he is communicating and revealing the Father to us. The Father is in heaven and seems so distant and so far away but he loved us so much that he communicated himself through Jesus to give us a revelation of himself so that we could see him more clearly. In the Gospel of John, John chapter 1 verse 1, the word of God says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. In John 1.14 it says, and the word was made flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word word right there in the Greek language is logos. There's a lot of different ways that this word can be used, but in its base root meaning, the word literally means communication. There's a communication that's taking place. Jesus is the communication of the Father. Jesus is the representation of the Father. Jesus is the way that God the Father has chosen to reveal and communicate himself to a lost and a dying world. I need you to know this morning that you have a home and that you have a father, but you'll never know either if you don't get to know Jesus. Amen. The words written on the pages of this book right here reveal Jesus. They reveal the story of the heart of God, a heart of love that's so giving and so loving that it shows itself at the cross. The cross is a picture to many people of an offense. When they see a bloody Savior, most, most times nowadays in society, people don't want to hear anything about that. Because it represents, it's such a mutilated, bloody scene that speaks to the fact that this had to happen because of your sinful condition. Amen. And people don't want anything getting between them and their sinful condition. That's right. Because most times people love their sinful condition. Amen. They don't want to stay all up in the midst of it. But the truth be told is that this is what it communicates. It communicates the fact of God's love is what it's really communicating. Yeah. It's not saying, oh, I, I, you know, that he's wanting to ruin your party. No, because the party leads is a lie. It ain't going to be like ACDC said. Now, all my friends are going to be there too. Uh, you know, no, you're on a highway to hell, all right, but it ain't, and your friends might be there, but it ain't going to be a party when you get there. Right. It's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place where the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. Right. It's not a place that we want to be. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten right. son. This is how he has chosen to reveal and to communicate yeah. his love yeah. to mankind. That's what he's communicating when he sends Jesus. That's what he's communicating when he chronicles the words of the master. When he chronicles the words of all the Old Testament prophets leading up to the day that Jesus would come. He says, I'm communicating to you a plan. I'm communicating to you my son. This is the communication. I love you. Amen. I sent my son to die for you. I have a plan of hope for you. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to be troubled and lacking peace and uncertainty. Learn of my son and you will learn of me. The words and the work of Jesus reveal the father. The only way we're ever going to know anything other than this crazy world that we've been born into. <laughs> and the only way we're going to know anything different than this crazy world that we were raised by our parents to believe in. And then I'm not picking on our parents. They just did what they were taught. The only way we're going to know anything different is to know the Lord. And the Lord will reveal to us the Father. Number one, you have a home. Number two, you have a father. Number three, you have a comforter. Amen. John 14, verses 15 through 18. Jesus says, if you love, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. The followers of the Lord keep his word. That's what he said. If you love me, keep my commandments. But his word, his commandments are in opposition to everything that is followers face. The world system driven by the spirit of Antichrist and the enemy of your soul, also known as Satan, everything that he offers, everything that he does upon the face of this earth is in opposition to what Jesus and his disciples stand for. But he promises not to leave us as orphans. That's the point. That I, that's what I'm trying to get myself in the mindset of. I'm trying to imagine myself as one of the disciples. This fledgling early, even before the book of Acts takes off, where this fledgling group of men have chosen to disconnect from the world, connect themselves to Jesus, and they're the only ones. And now they know 
Jesus is going away and they feel like they're going to be orphans. They feel like they're going to be without hope. They feel like they're going to be without strength. But the Lord is saying, I'm going to send another comforter. And the word another means another of the same kind. Oh, yeah. Jesus and the Holy Ghost aren't too different. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. Amen. And Jesus is promising that I'm going to send you a comforter. You know, the idea of a comforter right here isn't like a little blankie. I think I have a blankie back there for whenever it's, whenever it's cold and I'm over here, you know, I try, and sometimes whenever I'm studying, it's cold out there, you know, so I'll kind of wrap up in a blanket, lay down on the altar when I study. I, I thought about grabbing it and dragging it around like Linus would. That's not the idea of what he's talking about here, a little blankie that, you know, I see this, <laughs> I see this guy in the gym and I think he must have had a blankie when he was young. I'm not picking on people with blankies. I never had a blankie, but, you know, I'm sure I had my own little things. But I see this guy at the gym. He's like 50 years old, and he has this towel that he always has, and he has the, the tip of it in, the, in his mouth, and he walks around like that, chewing on this blankie every time I see him. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if he had a blankie when he was young, because you don't know, see kids that kind of do the same. Anyway, the idea behind this comforter is not a little blankie that we go around, and every time we face something that's tough, Every time we face something that's rough, that we're tatad, right, and, and that we're stroked and, and, and told that everything's going to be okay, right? But in reality, this word comfort, well, I thought this was good. This word comfort that we, that we translated as our English word comfort has the idea of shrink bomb. From the Latin, there's two words that make up this word. And one of them is this word right here, fortis, which is where we get the word fortress. Fortify. It has the word of strength connected to it. See, the comfort connected to strength. Another comforter. He's the one that's been called alongside to help, to give us strength. Because you see, the disciples, just like you and I, are facing a world that is in opposition Amen. of everything having to do with the word and the kingdom of God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But his commandments are contrary to everything that this world stands for. Therefore, you're going to find yourself alone on an island, but then again, not. You're not alone. Hallelujah. You have a home. You have a father. And you have a comforter. And it's not some little shri shriveled up or tattered up blankie. No, it's the presence of the Holy Ghost that's living in you and strengthening you. He's fortifying you and he's with you every step of the way that no matter what you face, let your heart not be troubled Amen. and be not afraid. Amen. God has a plan. If you go to Romans chapter 5, verse 5, see, and the plan is, is that he would give us the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is promising. Another comforter, another one like me. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. A word of hope. The Holy Spirit has been given unto you. When you got saved and the Holy Spirit moved into your heart, the love of God was shed abroad in you. Hey Amen. Something happened on the inside of you and you should have been able to feel it. If you never felt that before, what, you, what am I supposed to be feeling, preacher? Well, not necessarily goosebumps, but feeling that you know something's different than the way it used to be. Amen. Amen. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you ask forgiveness of your sin, the weight of sin should have fallen off at least for a day or so. Yeah. <laughs> hey Amen. You, you should have felt something that was different than ever before. Where the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart and dealing with your life. Amen. If you go back to Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 5. He says in verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith. And we talk about this a lot in this church. We probably even talked about it the last time I preached. The word justified means to be declared innocent by God. How are you declared innocent by God? God sent his innocent one, Jesus, to pay the penalty for your sin. When he died on the cross, and then you heard the gospel and put your faith in that, an exchange took place. He took your guilt and gave you his righteousness. Based on that, the Father says, justified. He says, it's as though you never sinned. Amen. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. 
Because of the fact that we're no longer guilty in the eyes of God, we have access through grace into the presence of God where we can stand in the face of opposition. Let your heart not be troubled. Even though my word and my ways are in opposition to the kingdom of this world, let your heart not be troubled because you're given grace, power from the Holy Ghost, shed abroad in your heart, a comforter of the same kind to be with you every step of the way. Where to give you the strength that you need to stand. Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. There's going to be tough times. Also knowing that tribulation works patience, it teaches us endurance. And patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not a shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Jesus gave us his righteousness as a gift. And we believed that the plan of God, the result was that we were given the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts. The Holy Spirit gives us strength and hope. <clears throat> As we journey towards our home to see our Father. Last point that I wanted to make is that we have a promise of peace. We have a home. We have a Father. We have a Comforter. And we have a promise of peace. John 14, 27. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Can you go to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 real quick? In that passage of scripture, the Apostle Paul says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus said, peace I will leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives it, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Paul says that the peace of God surpasses understanding. It doesn't make any sense. Amen. Jesus said, I'm not going to give you the kind of peace that the world gives. The world gives peace based on external circumstances. You know what I'm saying? In other words, the car's not breaking down anymore. <laughs> Anybody ever been like me? Dude, I still buy used cars, but thank God the Lord's been holding them together for me. I used to have the biggest problems with vehicles. I'm talking about blowing another head gasket, you know, time and again. Oh, dude, just as soon as I thought things were going in the right direction. Oh, man, got my income taxes back. Got a little money in my pocket. Bam, $1,500 damage to my car, you know, something like that. Oh, I don't have any peace. I'm lacking peace, you know. Uh, and what I guess I'm trying to say is, is this is that many times that's how we equate whether there's peace in our life. Things are going good on the job front, got a promotion, got a raise. Things are going good in the house, so everybody's getting along good. Things are going good, the car's not breaking down. That's external, that's the kind of peace that the world offers. Whenever you have stuff going in the right direction, going in your way, the kind of peace that Jesus offers, it doesn't have anything to do with what's going on external, amen? It's something that's going on internal. That's why it surpasses understanding, it doesn't make any sense. That you can still be in pain, your car could be broke down, you could be broke, busted, and disgusted, and at the same time, though I'm not saying that it happens this way every day, come on somebody, help me out here, but I am gonna tell you that I have experienced on the shadow of a doubt that I could be in the midst of pain, in the midst of negative circumstances, and the Holy Spirit shed abroad in my heart, giving me hope, is giving a peace that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. God showed up and gave peace when it didn't make any sense. That's how I know it's from the Lord. The world can't give me that peace. Amen. Amen. Only God can give that peace. Amen. And that's the peace that Jesus offers. It's an inner peace that isn't based on external situations. <clears throat> With the kind of peace that Jesus offers, everything could be falling apart around you, but the presence of God gives peace. The Holy Spirit that dwells in you gives hope and strength. So remember this morning, you're not an orphan. You have a home. Yes. Amen? Yes. Jesus is preparing an eternal dwelling place for you. Hallelujah. So no matter how bad things seem sometimes here, hold on to the Lord and trust Him until He comes back to get you as His bride. Amen? Yes. Number two, you have a father. 
You no longer have to wander aimlessly in this world wondering who you are or what your purpose is. You're a child of God and your purpose is to serve him. Amen. Number three, you have a comforter. He's the Holy Spirit and he lives in you. He goes wherever you go. He's right there waiting for your call for help so he can come alongside to strengthen you. Number four, you have a promise of peace. You don't have a promise that nothing will never go wrong, but you do have the promise that Jesus offers a peace that comforts even when things around you don't change right away.